Hey, welcome again to uh, the Newburyport Documentary Film Festival. I am Program Director James Sullivan. We are previewing our feature films for our upcoming 19th festival uh, from September 15th to 17th. Um, and we're very excited about the lineup, including the film that we're going to be talking about uh, over the next few minutes. We Today we have with us uh, filmmaker Michael Lippert, who is uh, based in North Carolina. He is bringing a film to us called Sloan, a jazz singer. Hi, Michael. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Um, so tell us, for the sake of, I mean, I know the answer to this, but someone watching this may not yet know. Give me sort of your elevator speech or tell me who Sloan was, Carol Sloan, and uh, why you why you wanted to make this film about her. Yeah, well, Carol Sloan is kind of one of the unsung jazz singers of the 20th century, uh, who was often compared to Ella Fitzgerald and some of the great names that we have heard of. But most people haven't heard of Carol Sloan in the mainstream public um, today. And so I wanted to make a film to kind of shed light on that and investigate why, because she really made an impact in the early 60s, singing at the Newport Jazz Festival with some really big names. She uh, played with Oscar Peterson. She had Richard Pryor opened for her. Mm -hmm. um, she did all kinds of amazing things. She was one of Johnny Carson's favorite guests, and she was mm -hmm. later called one of the greatest living jazz singers. Um, so we wanted to make a film that, gave um her due uh gave her her due as far as her place in the pantheon of great jazz singers and um in 2018 i was approached by stephen barefoot our executive producer who had a long-standing friendship and relationship with carol and he said would you like to make a film about her and i said who's carol sloan i didn't right. know anything about her and um he said, well, you've heard of Ella Fitzgerald and Carmen McRae and Sarah Vaughn and all these great singers, Billie Holiday. But but usually Carol is kind of mentioned as and then there's Carol mm -hmm. Sloan. Mm -hmm. He's sort of a footnote. And um, so, you know, coincidentally, I was able to see her perform in Chicago uh, on a business trip. And I just was was blown away. Um at the age of 82, she was still really um, hitting a home run and and sang uh, a cappella, which is one of the things she's sort of known for. And um, I just thought we've got to get her on camera and tell her story while she's still here with us. Yeah. And she had her major bucket list item was to sing and record one final live performance. And so right. she had this performance lined up at the legendary jazz club Birdland in New York city. Mm -hmm. And so I was just thinking, okay, we've got a great story, a great narrative to work towards with this climactic performance in New York. And so we spent the week prior, uh, really kind of getting to know her in her apartment as she prepared for this, um, you know, performance of a lifetime in, in late, which would be late 2019, right. just ahead of the pandemic. So, right. And, you know, the thing that really shines through in the film, I think, is that, you know, she was such a fun, sassy, uh, you know, spirited woman, even after all the sort of ups and downs of, uh, you know, trying to maintain a career after people had kind of, sort of forgotten her um yes. it must have been a lot of fun to just uh you know um shoot the breeze with her essentially right oh my gosh yes um it took a little while to win her trust i had you mm -hmm. know several phone calls with her ahead of yep. filming and then when we were with her we didn't have a lot of time i mean it was really five or six days before the performance and we went from her saying oh you're not you're not getting past the living room to <laughs> us just basically living in her whole apartment with her for a week and her <laughs> playing music on her computer for us and watching football, watching old movies. Yeah. And we really kind of developed a friendship. I think yeah. um, that was the coolest thing is that we developed this friendship. But yeah, she was, she, you know, she'd reached an age where I think she said, I'm going to say whatever I'm going to say, because <laughs> yeah. why not? You know, and and uh, she, you know, she spoke her mind and um knew that you know she she had just enough time left to to make one more big impact and so you know mm -hmm. i think she was happy to have this as much as she 
uh, acted like we were, we were kind of, um, you know, like pesky flies sometimes <laughs> right. realized like it was, it was nice to have this in her life. Right. Be because, uh, she is not quite as well remembered as some of the other great singers that you mentioned. Um, did you, was it a struggle to find archival, uh, material of, of Sloan? I mean, you know, the, the, we, I think we know that, that, that the early years of the tonight show, a lot of those tapes are erased, you know, they used right. to take the tapes and, uh, I mean, it's such a crime, but you know, in those days, the tape was expensive enough that the networks would say, oh, we'll just tape over that. We'll tape another episode yeah. over that. And then you go, well, so-and-so was on that episode that you, you know, uh, you know, in 1962, I'm sure that probably came up, right? Yeah, the word syndication didn't exist <laughs> yet. <laughs> the idea of, oh, maybe we could actually use this later. Yeah, and so Carol was sure that all of that was completely gone, that we weren't going to find any of it. Mm -hmm. But we were able to find uh, audio of a lot yep. of it and at the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. And one of our producers, Taylor Arnold, uh, went to the Library of Congress. He actually had to go there and get a library card. And he found not only recordings of The Tonight Show and Steve Allen, but also a recording from that very weekend where she was discovered at the Newport Jazz Festival. Mm -hmm. Um, right. That, That's amazing. That acapella performance of Little Girl Blue that caught the attention of Columbia Records and put her on her first major album and label. And um, so we felt very fortunate because before that, yes, it was very hard to find, especially any footage of her from the right. 60s. Um, there was more like late 70s, 80s, and then up to modern day. But there was a period where we just didn't have much. And mm -hmm. um, But we also found a photographer, Bob Bonas, who was uh, also a manager that she befriended, happened to be the manager for the Beatles and the Stones' mm -hmm. first North American tour uh, that she was able to go on, uh, not as a singer, but just because she had this friendship with Bob, mm -hmm. but he also took all these amazing photos and mm -hmm. a lot of, a lot of them include Carol. And so right. we used a lot of his collection. And then there's another photographer named Jim Marshall. Oh yeah. Who took photos of everybody who was everybody, um, not just jazz, but rock as well. And, um, but he has a ton of great jazz, um, you know, book books full of all his photos from different jazz festivals and carols and, and a ton of those as well. Mm -hmm. So over time and a, and a whole village of people helping us out and friends of Carol's and Carol's personal collection of photos, we were able to put it together. For the sake of anyone who hasn't seen it yet, let's take a quick look at the trailer and uh, you get a sense of uh, who, uh, who, who, you know, the, the lively person that Sloan was. <laughs> Carol Sloan is right in there with all the greats. She's legendary now. She worked with Ella Fitzgerald and Oscar Peterson. She was traveling with both the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. But she said, those were the guys who were going to change the world. I wasn't. Rock and roll washed over the country. That's what closed down the jazz clubs. She and some of her peers are not going to be remembered by the mass public. Can I ask you, you a question? Sure. Not to be the wrong way here. Are you famous and I just don't know it? When I was very young, the world was younger than I. How about that? I haven't heard that woman's voice in a very long time. I do not care. I really just have always wanted to be considered one of the best. So I really want one more album that dream before I kick the bucket. I said, you know, let's do this. Let's do a live recording. Come on, baby. When all the Crosby's disappear. Milwaukee stops producing beer. There are people traveling from Chicago and Japan. And can I produce what they expect? I hope I can. Plus, you've got this documentary. Here you all are. I don't believe I'm doing this. I don't believe any of this is happening. Something in myself is saying, you're not quite good enough to be doing this. And you may never get there. 
How's it look? Looks like an old lady to me. Oh, oh it's going to look great. I'm going to fall flat on my face. My voice is going to fail me. I'm absolutely terrified. All I want to do is shut this damn thing down and I go to bed. The minute you get up there, and it transforms. If you're an artist, what you're expressing stays there as long as you're alive. I want to convey to the audience, I have been through this. I can still remember the heartbreak. And somehow, I've survived. So much fun and so sweet. Um, we're really excited to bring the film here, uh, which will be our closing night film on uh, Sunday, September 17th. Michael uh, lives in North Carolina, but will be joining us uh, virtually for a Q&A with the audience after the screening. So we look forward to that. I have one last question for you, Michael, mm -hmm. um, for now. Um, and then I'll have plenty more uh, on the day of the screening. Um, I'm just curious, can you tell us a little bit about your own jazz background? I bet you Sloan probably was sort of like, yeah, you're too young to know what you're talking about, right? Like, uh, oh. did you, <laughs> yeah, I mean, were, were you already a jazz fan uh, uh, when, when, you, when you came upon her story? I was a jazz fan, um, but I learned from her that I didn't know as much as I thought I knew. <laughs> <laughs> and really, uh, it's funny, I was just saying this to someone else, I, I think of her now almost as a, a mentor, even though mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be a professional singer or musician, but I learned so much in the span of those few days we had yeah. with her uh, about life and about following your art and um, her approach and her technique. Um, you know, her approach to music was very much about uh, finding yourself in the song because she was picking from the great American songbook. And so, even though she wasn't the writer, she was, um, you know, she was finding music that spoke to her mm -hmm. and she felt that she was singing the story of her life. And mm -hmm. that if there was that emotional connection, that was the most important thing. Uh, it wasn't just about having a flowery voice and singing a pretty song. Um, it was about a connection with the audience and, uh, so, uh, you know, I learned a lot from her, but, but, but prior, um, really my interest in jazz, um, at, growing up was little to none. I mean, I grew up with rock and hip hop and, you know, everything, um, that mm -hmm. is current, you know, but I, uh, really only heard jazz on my, my grandmother's radio. And I thought <laughs> of it as what, what my grandma listened to when she drove to the store, what my grandma listened to when she was cooking in the kitchen or whatever. Yep. Uh, but then in college, I was in a play called Sideman, which was a short lived Broadway show about an aging um, yeah. trumpet player. Um, have you heard of it? Or, uh, no, I, I'm, just, I, I'm just most people haven't. I yeah, yeah. But but it was the first time that I had really been asked to really just listen to mm -hmm. a jazz composition and what the musicians were doing. And it was a. a a night, a night in Tunisia was the track, uh, yeah. which I think with Dizzy Gillespie, right? And uh, and and just the musicianship just blew me away, and just the idea that they're creating art in the moment, they're creating a really sophisticated composition in the in the heat of the moment that will never be able to be repeated exactly like that, and has never been performed that way before, and and just that idea of of improvisation and being in the moment is is so cool to me and even now you know we made this film about carol and we've now kind of memorialized the the show at at birdland but there's nothing like seeing it in person right and so you know one one of the messages i guess we want to send with the film is support live entertainment mm -hmm. um, support uh singers and musicians and people who uh should get more fair compensation for what they do, but also um, just that idea of experiencing something together that we, we sort of took for granted and then the pandemic happened and then, and then we went, Oh, wow. You know, this, this performance from Carol, things like this are even more special than we realized. Um, yeah. I'm sort of drifting into a different territory, but 
uh, that's just a really important point, I think. Uh, and that's why I hope people come out to see the film at Newburyport as opposed to waiting to stream it. Mm -hmm. I think just experiencing art together is, is just so important. Uh, you uh, Exactly. Um, I was going to say, <laughs> support your local film festival. Uh, exactly. You know, yeah. And, you know, you know uh, next best thing to seeing Sloan um, uh, on stage would be to see Michael's film about her. So um, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, we look forward to speaking with you again um, in a couple of weeks. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Thanks again, Michael. We'll see you soon. Um, we All just right. want to take a moment to thank our sponsors and uh, we'll see you with our next preview shortly.